So I talked a lot um, in some of the previous lectures about what um, kinds of abstract theories we might use to think about life and how astrobiology is now merging with these other fields like artificial life um, or how people are thinking um, quantitatively about information in biology to inspire new thinking for astrobiology. But this still stands the question, what is life and what are we talking about? And this is actually a very old question um, asked by many, many people over many decades um, and even the hundreds of years all the way back to ancient Greeks. Um, so humans have been asking a question about what, what life is for a very long time. Um, but I think the perspective that Erwin Schrodinger had was a really nice one um, where he wanted to understand whether um, we could explain life with current knowledge and it just required that we apply the theories we have to life. So if we take all of physics as we know it and we apply it to life, could we explain what life is? Um, and he wrote this wonderful little book called What is Life in 1944 that was um, inspired by a set of lectures that he gave the prior year. Um, and at the end of that book I, is one of my favorite quotes um, where he talks about the fact that we might actually need other laws of physics to explain life and that life might be sufficiently weird as a physical phenomenon to not be explained by any of our current theories. And as an astrobiologist, I find this incredibly exciting because I really think about looking for life and looking for alien life as like the next frontier in physics that we're really going to discover new principles about how our universe works um, once we understand what life is. And so I think one of the things that we can do as an exercise is we don't really know what life looks like, but we might ask critically, what are the examples of life on Earth? And how can we think about them in terms of how we could build a unified theory for what life is? A real um, predictive theory that allows us to understand not just life on this planet and life on other worlds. And to, to think about that kind of problem, it helps to draw inspiration from thinking about the history of science in general. And I was trained as a, a theoretical physicist, and so um, I, I, I sort of academically grew up thinking about the history of physics and the history of unifications in physics. And we have this wonderful sort of hierarchy of theories that physicists um, have come up with over many hundreds of years, actually, um, since um, uh, modern physics emerged um, with the work of Newton and Galileo, um, we've had basically a long tradition of realizing disparate phenomena um, were actually part of the, the same kind of phenomena. So for example, electricity and magnetism were realized to actually be part of this one kind of um, phenomena called electromagnetism. And then we realized that there was something called the electroweak force, which unifies that with the the weak force. Um, and so we have this kind of idea in physics of this hierarchy of theories and unifications. Um, but of course, we see that the theory of everything is a theory except those things that theorize. This kind of, these theories that we have so far that are most fundamental theories of how the natural world works don't include anything about complex systems and they don't include anything about us or life. Um, and so the challenge is how can we um, think about how we can approach an explanatory theory for life and, and will drawing inspiration from um, theories of physics or the way that we've built um, fundamental theories of the natural world actually help in that regard. Um, and so, so I, as I mentioned, think it's really constructive to think about the examples of life on Earth. And I put life in quotation marks because uh, we don't actually know what life is. We don't know if it's a hard boundary between non-life and life. Um, maybe life is not even a natural kind. It's not actually a category of nature. Um, but I think to, to actually do astrobiology effectively, we need to think about life as an objective property. We need to think about how we can quantify it. And we need to think about what the examples are and whether some systems are more alive than other systems and how we should think about that. Um, and so everyone is, is pretty familiar with the idea of thinking about a cell as a unit of life, as an example of life. Um, and that, you know, the chemical organization inside a cell, this is an organization of metabolism, um, basically how you turn cheeseburgers into you, um, that, you know, we're, we're sort of intrinsically taught, our, our biology textbooks teach us that these things are what life is, right? But what, but what about things that push the extremes of the boundaries of where life is and, and what can exist? So this is a tardigrade, it's an example of an extremophile. Um, and tardigrades are known to be able to live under the conditions in space. Um, and um, there's lots of organisms that can live under extreme conditions of temperature or pressure 
um, can be totally desiccated water, can live in nuclear reactors, can live deep under the Earth's surface. So we might think um, about what are sort of the extremes of life as a way of understanding where life can exist versus where life can't exist. Um, and that's sort of been a traditional program in astrobiology is to explore extremophiles and to understand the limits of life from that perspective. Um, but there's other ways of thinking about the boundaries of life and how we might actually think about what life is. And so um, this example here is actually a, um, a planaria um, that has been um, manipulated by changing um, some of the ion potentials in its cells. Um, and you can actually reprogram the planaria to have what's called an unnatural phenotype. So the, the traditional phenotype for the planaria is to have a head and a tail. But if you um, do this kind of manipulation that they do um, in Mike Levin's lab at Tufts University, they can actually make um, the planaria have two heads as opposed to a tail and a head. And so you might think, um, well, this is kind of a, a, a really freak thing <laughs> to happen, um, but these are actually um, viable organisms. They can live in the lab um, for a certain extent of time. They, they, they don't have sort of the normal appetite of normal planaria, but they are a living entity. Um, and they've basically been reprogrammed to have this sort of unnatural state, the state that we wouldn't actually observe in natural biological systems. And so uh, an, uh, a thought for astrobiologists is to see how far we can actually push biological systems and still have them function. So what are the limits of sort of the space of, of viable life um, within the examples of organisms we have. And so this is one case where you're actually manipulating the morphology or the phenotype of the organism. You might also think in, in synthetic biology, people like to um, talk about um, changing out RNA and DNA for other XNAs, other kinds of nucleic acids like therous nucleic acid or peptide nucleic acid. And it's actually been shown that they can function in cells. So you could imagine taking a cell and starting to step out from um, known chemistry and replace the chemical parts. Um, and that's another way of sort of exploring if we have a living thing, how far can we actually push it and still have it be alive? And what are the, the boundaries of that process? Um, so we're not exploring the physical boundaries in the sense that we did with extremophiles where we're looking at temperature and pressure and environmental conditions. But in this case, it's almost in some sense the informational boundaries. How far can we actually manipulate the information of the system? Um, reprogram it and still have it be a viable living entity. Um, other ways that we might think about pushing the boundaries of what we understand as life is to think about life at different scales of organization. And so this image is from the, the lab of Stephen Pratt at Arizona State University. Um, and they actually study um, social insects such as ants. This is a Temnothorax ant um, and their collective behavior. And the thing that's really interesting about uh, social insects is that it's really the colony level that is um, the evolving um, entity or the, the organism in some sense. So people in that field will talk about this idea of a super organism where all the individuals have basically subsumed most of their function in service of the colony. And so they're not really the, the proper unit for thinking about the function of that biological system. It's really at the level of the colony. Um, and so we've seen lots of major transitions over the history of life on Earth. We went from single cells to multicellular organisms. Multicellular organisms form societies. Um, societies have technology. And so the question is, is life a property across all these scales? Is it not just a property of chemistry? And I think that there's a, a sort of misunderstanding when we think about life as a chemical phenomena um, that we have a tendency to want to define life as chemistry. Um, but it's really probably the case or it could be the case um, that life emerges at chemist in, in the scale of chemistry, but life is a property of all of these other kinds of systems. And so you could push that pretty far, and you might talk even about the organization of human systems, things like cities. Are they living entities? Certainly a city wouldn't exist without life, um, but is a city itself alive, and how do we think about that? Does that help us think about more radical examples of life um, that might exist on other, other worlds. And so part of the reason for thinking about these alternative examples of life on Earth and not just the chemical examples is that they really force us to think more abstractly and more generally about what life is. 
And ultimately, that's really useful for astrobiologists because if life exists in different chemistry, it might have the same kinds of abstract organizational principles as life on Earth. And we need to understand what those are. They might exist across many scales. Um, and they might um, then allow us to build those predictive models for life in other systems. And so how far can we actually push that? Well, there's a lot of interest in astrobiology nowadays even about thinking about life as a planetary scale process. Um, and so that goes back to Lovelock and the Gaia hypothesis and the idea that, that life is so entwined with the functioning of our planet from a geological and geochemical perspective that we should think about life itself as a planetary process. Um, and there's new ways from complex systems about thinking about that. So just one example um, is um, the image shown here of a network representation of all of the chemistry of the biosphere. So all of the chemistry that life catalyzes on Earth. And you can start to study the properties of those systems at a planetary scale to think about new ways of thinking about what living organization is and what life does to planets. Um, and so this gets in the idea of thinking about all these different stages of what life could be and examples of life on Earth and how we should think about life um, once we move beyond just thinking about chemical definitions for life um, or a cellular definition for life. But what about the stages that might have preceded the things that we really want to call alive? Are there things that are almost alive? Do they manifest some of the same principles of physics as living entities do? Um, and so one example of this is actually from uh, Lee Cronin's lab. They have a, a chemical oil droplet system where they evolve simple mixtures of um, different chemical compounds to display many different complex and rich behaviors. And many of these look very lifelike, but there's only you know, four simple chemicals um, making up these oil droplets. And so you might think that this is actually an example of an almost living system. It has a lot of properties of life, but is not exactly alive. So can we build more of these kinds of systems? Can we understand them? Can we quantify them by the same metrics that we might quantify how alive a city is versus a colony of ants? These are all great questions for astrobiology and they help to open up the space of thinking about what is it that we mean when we say this system is an example of life and this system is not and how do we use that as a tool for doing astrobiology? And so I think the ultimate question that we're really after is to really think about life from a first principles perspective and understand life as a fundamental property of some physical systems and that some fraction of the universe actually becomes animate, becomes living. And we don't understand how that process happens yet. We don't understand what that process is. And we don't even really know what it looks like. Um, but the question for astrobiology is, you know, what fraction of the universe is living and how do we discover it and understand its properties?